So we've got we've got the green light to press on. So um, given AI, Gen AI is all the talk, we're just going to um, jump straight into this. So um, we'll have a go. My name is uh, Chris Peter. I'm a professor of uh, design informatics at the University of Edinburgh. So to some extent, being a designer, a creative, fascinating the way that um, humans have generated inspiring movements through imagination. Then, of course, leaning into informatics, uh, Edinburgh's got a very strong track record in AI from the 1960s. So always fascinated working with colleagues in computer science, trying to straddle that space where they have the moves, but we have the magic. But it's, it's an interesting time, of course, because in the last... 12 months, of course, we've all been somewhat overwhelmed with the tools which have cascaded down from the ivory towers right into um, our desktops, into our, probably our children's hands as well. I remember when Snap suddenly released uh, a bot for my daughter during last year's exams, and you suddenly saw them revising, preparing in completely different ways to that which I certainly grew up with. So really fascinating moment, I think, for all of us. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, we're going to set this up, and hopefully it's a very motivating conversation for today. I've got three brilliant panellists who have all lent in to offer questions around what the implications are for authorship, copyright, fair awards, so on and so forth, and we'll talk about these new tools. And is it truly co-creative? And who are we co-creating with? Because after all, of course, it's all our data. The, the, there's no bots from Venus or Mars. This is our material <laughs> that we're generating in the past or in the present that then, of course, we're regurgitating through various LLMs, uh, large image models or large audio models. So, fascinating idea that when we put the bot out there, it's no longer. It's in amongst us and we're using it and it's algorithmic. Let me introduce the panellists, though, um, and then I'm going to ask... I've got three questions. I thought I'd treat myself to three questions before you guys get started, but do rehearse. Um, so I'll introduce the panellists and then we'll get underway. So, Lara is an experienced strategist and policy changemaker with a, de a demonstrable track record in evidence-based policy development and influencing. She's current director of policy and engagement at Creative UK, where she works directly with policymakers, politicians, creative individuals, and organisations to champion creative industries in the UK. Creative UK is the UK's only independent network spanning the breadth of the cultural and creative industries. They advocate with and for their hundreds of members on the social and economic impact of investing in creativity. In addition to policy influencing, research and advocacy, they provide access to world-class investment through a VC fund run by experts in the cultural and creative industries. Now, Rachel, this isn't Rachel, this is Ken. Now, Ken's kindly joined us because Rachel Lisk is poorly today. Um, so I'm, I've only got Rachel's bio, Ken. <laughs> so listen, I mean, this is what happens. Deep fakes, right? We just manifest the deepest fake possible. Um, let's have a look. So, <laughs> um, well, uh, so Rachel had and has taken a, prof a professional journey that has diverged from a typical performing arts career. Until I do this, um, I mean, you're both involved in co-founding uh, Daci or D-A-A-C-I? Darcy. Darcy, sorry. Um, and Rachel's strength was in, a, within the, in the field of um, AI-based music, um, and she trains a composer. Ken, do you want to just give me a clue? I feel terrible. Just... Yeah, to, uh, firstly, uh, forgive Rachel. She's uh, travelling more than Alan Wicker at the moment, uh, so it's got off a plane from India with also, in fact, New York. Um, there, there's no good telling, uh, with all sorts of illness. Uh, so I stepped in at 10 p.m. last night, yeah, very whatever. Um, I, I'm uh, within Darcy. Darcy is a creative, uh, generative, adaptive AI technology firm in the music space. That, thank you, perfect. It's live, isn't it? It's happening in front of you, which is generative, right? <laughs> so, and then Ollie Oliver Brown is an academic interested in understanding artistic and music, musical creativity using digital technology and its relation to society. He's worked in the field of computational creativity, the study of the automation of creative tasks since 2007, seeing massive transformations in technological capability leading up to the current explosion in AI, art, and music. He's also author of Beyond the Creative Species Making Machines That Make Art and Music, which is published by Emma. Press um, just a couple of years ago, and it's now available as free EPUB. So there you go. We're giving things away. Get on it, and um, we'll get started straight away. So I'm interested, and I, I'm going to sit down. It's that's okay. Sorry, folks at the back. We haven't got rate seating. We didn't have it in the 19th century. So there we go. 
Um, I've got three questions because I'm probing the implications, particularly from the academy, into R&D. Many of us are gathered here today because of a relationship with clusters, um, this closing the gap between what we do in the academy with industry and finding out where the best place is for R&D. Um, so some of the background to the questions are entirely predicated on this. But I'm a strong believer that along with any disruptive technology, there are those who stand to benefit Something comes along, whether it's the Model 4T car um, or whether it's uh, ChatGPT. Um, but I'd like the panelists to tell me who's benefiting from Gen AI, but who's losing out at the moment? And then we'll talk about the future. So, shall we, Ken? You fancy going first? Um, <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, who's, who's benefiting? Uh, well, at the moment, those people who write the news stories, the scare stories. Um, we, we often quote, um, to use your urge, that Henry Ford within the office. If Henry Ford often said, if I asked my customer what they wanted, they'd have asked for a faster horse. Uh, AI is uh, another step on that evolutionary process, if you like. Uh, there's a fabulous quote uh, from a guy called Chris Cook, uh, who says that the the history of the music industry is basically a story about how a sequence of new technologies has respectively changed the way music is recorded, made, distributed, uh, shared and consumed. So if we think about CDs, the internet, iPhones, drum machines, uh, uh, synthesizers, AI is just another step on that ev evolutionary process. Uh, so who benefits? All of us, all of us. The distribution of this, the, the, the democratization of these tools with a big caveat that as long as those tools are ethical tools, tools that respect the rights of labels, rights holders, artists, composers. So we will all benefit. Ollie, pick up the baton. Well, great start. Um, so I think, it's a, I think it's a great question because it's such a nuanced answer uh, and I don't think I have, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put my money on one, on, on one group or another. I mean, there are some obvious pointers, but, but the point I'd like to make in response to that question is it's a very fragmented world. And also we're all, we're all adaptive. So um, if you're not one of the people that benefits, you can maneuver yourself to be one of the people that benefits. Um, take, take tech companies that are innovating AI, creative AI products. Obviously, that might be uh, where we would expect to see the most um, success and, and the winners. But of course, it's a hugely crowded and competitive market. And what that means is that within that space of tech companies, there's going to be a lot of serious crash crashes and failures and, and people who have backed the wrong horse or, um, excuse the pun, <laughs> it's not meant to be. Um, so, and of course, the other, the, and, and that includes media companies that are in, employing new uh, software and new, new workers, they have to get it right. So just because you're a fast, smart adopter, you're not necessarily the one that benefits. That's important to notice. Obviously, artists uh, are facing risks in terms of uh, copyright infringement and new, completely radically new forms of um, creation uh, that challenge our, our very concepts of copyright. Um, but we're already beginning to see the, uh, the resistance to that playing out. Um, the question I'd like to ask then in addition is, is, the, is to really focus on audiences because quite often the debate gets very stuck in artists versus tech companies. And whenever technology comes along and changes mus uh, musical or, or artistic experience, um, there, are, there are new possibilities for audiences and we can, um, Really, we need to have frameworks that respect uh, the, the, the global impacts for creative arts, culture, and the value of the creative arts, not just the economic revenue aspects. Very good. Nice to hear a triple bottom line, perhaps a creative bottom line yeah. as well. That's very good. Lara? Well, I, I mean, building off of what Ollie said, I actually sort of even took issue with your framing of the question, <laughs> just because like, I would hope that it's not so binary that there are winners and losers, and I, I think it's much more complicated than that. Um, I think speaking from the pers like the vantage point that I've got, representing artists and creators of all kinds, whether or not they're working in structured organizations um, that are primarily commercial in nature, or whether or not they're in grassroots environments, 
uh, there are some clear losers right now. And I, I'll, I'll start with a metaphor that I heard a politician, unfortunately it was in a closed meeting, so I can't tell you who said it. Um, but a politician said a couple weeks ago in, in a round table I was in, you know, the, the copyright and infringement bit in terms of having, it's a bit like if you came home and you found your entire house had been ransacked and every object that you've ever owned or loved has been stolen. And then you went out and you saw it in every single market and you had no ability to obtain or influence what was happening in that space. So while I don't wish to get stuck in the way things were, we do have to start from the premise that that is the way things currently are for rights holders. And so I think from that perspective, there are clear losers in thinking about what, what might happen if we don't change the paradigm we're in. Um, and so picking up on the back end of your question, Chris, which was about what is the long-term prognosis, you know, um, I also think before I get to that bit, it's important to remember that creators and artists and those who innovate have always been at the forefront of disruption, whether or not that was, tech, you know, that is technological intervention or it's of a social nature. So you are talking about the very community who's, if I can sort of, you know, pathos it a bit, has a very ideation nature, which is entirely about destroying constructs and evolving systems. So it, it isn't even so, so black and white as to say rights holders, you know, are in one camp and they're not users of this technology. So I think we have to remember that complexity as well. So when I look ahead and I think about the future, I think about two things. One, I think about um, what you were saying about the fact that not all, like the media is playing a very big role here in terms of how much it's hyping up the debate. Um, I think that we should recognize that there are some developers, designers, and appliers of artificial intelligence who are behaving more ethically. And I think we need to look to them and be able to give them more space to be able to talk about what they're doing and to showcase the transparent nature of how they're going about things as, as an exemplar. And I think that we should work really hard to position creators, whether or not they're artists or musicians or of any nature, or indeed technological innovators at the table in an equal way to the big technology firms. And I think this, it might sound very idealistic, but when I look ahead, that is the only way we're gonna change this paradigm, is if there is more equitability in voices. And I guess my closing thought would be, whenever you wanna ask who the winner or loser in a conversation is, you have to look and see who's not in this room. And you have to think about whose voice, even in this room here, who is not in this room, whose voice is not being heard, whose voice is not being represented. And those are the real losers in the debate, right? And those are the people that we should actually be seeking to bring into this conversation, whoever those folks are. Terrific. Look at that, 9.37, and you had triple espressos. <laughs> Bad boom. That's fantastic. I, mean, I, I think uh, my team, particularly, and everyone work with Codebase, and the best defense against the dark arts from their perspectives was always creatives. You're absolutely right. They're the ethicists. We live and surround ourselves, yes, with hackers and hustlers, but we see ourselves as ethicists. So lovely. Great points. Right, let's have a go number two. This has got off to a good start. Um, so two of our panelists have direct connections to universities, perhaps demonstrating that research in the academy is part of a co-creative R&D economy with industry. In the recent past, this may have been due to the privileged access to particular te technologies, such as AI. Is that likely to continue? If Is more open access to Gen I technology going to flatten the R&D landscape? Is the genie out of the bottle, the academy? Um, and yeah, Ollie and Ken, you are, you've got direct connections, so I'm assuming there may well be some, Queen Mary or UNSW, that you, they've got some privileged access there. But on the other hand, now, if it's out, does that change how we do R&D? Yeah, massive, uh, massive topic for me. I'm, I'm an academic. I, I spend my time looking at um, research funding and collaborations. Um, uh, I, I think the change. I mean, in terms of privileged access, uh, you know, we now live in a world where uh, this innovation is is pretty much entirely commercially driven. It's large large companies with big investments uh, looking for profitable business models driving their innovation in this area. Um, and many years ago, we were in a world where there was much more research, public, uh, publicly funded um, research. Now, there's a lot of things are changing all, all at the same time. Uh, research is becoming more open. It was never that open in the past. We, had, we didn't have open access principles and so on. Um, so it was relatively close. But I think the main barrier to entry to working with creative AI technologies was programming skills. That was what, that was what people needed. Um, for years, I worked in an area where, no, I mean, unless you had a budget to pay programmers, then um, the, you know, the people that were, were exploring this work as artists were artist programmers. And that's actually very interesting to see how that's changed because only very recently, with the sort of wave of GPT and Dolly and all of these uh, text-driven tools, text 
I mean, this, this is the key innovation, is that text, it's not the key innovation, but it's such an important transformation in terms of user interface and creative affordances that we can use a, a text prompt as, a, as an input. It, can, it massively, massively opens up who can have access to this technology. So there is this, I, I, I will contest the word democratization because democratization is about control and it's, it's, not, being, it's not a democratization, but there is this uh, leveling in a sense of access, just like Google um, provided access to millions of users. Again, you make an excellent point that that, that potentially ignores vast ways of people who don't have computers or access to the internet um, and so on. Um, but, so returning back to the immediate problems uh, I face, I think that research does two things in relation to this technology. One, one is it innovates the technology, it works in, a, in an innovation and engineering sense, space, and I've worked in that space, but it also has an essential role in, in the critical discourse around how we're using that technology, policies, and so on. Um, and it's so essential that the latter is given access to the commercial world and collaborates with the, with the commercial sector um, and has a voice, and, and of course we do have a voice, you know, uh, universities and ac academics are not silenced by any means, but at the moment there, there is just um, a huge space of urgent need for many voices, and as you say, identifying those, all of those voices that need to be at that table. Ken and Laura? Yeah, if I, if I pick up the points, if we, if we change the words, at democratization, we say uh, dissemination uh, is probably a better term. Uh, again, I, I think about what could be, how many Beethovens have there been in our history that never got access to a piano as a child? Give people access and, uh, and, and, and you will see creation. Uh, and as far as uh, funding creativity is, uh, and research is concerned, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Darcy funds uh, PhD students. Uh, Darcy has an AI lab. Um, uh, and we fund that. Uh, we fund that research, obviously, for, for commercial purposes. As we all have to survive. But we are funding that research in order that that technology can be disseminated that it, it gets in everybody's hands, whoever you are, wherever you are in the world. Lara. I've kind of lost the thread of the question, to be honest, Chris. But um, I, I, I'm sort of struck by two things. I was thinking about this notion that I was I was in a, another policy environment arguing about, I can't remember what, and um, thinking about who, who produces the technology, who produces, who drives the research and development, who produces the culture, who consumes it. Like all of these things are affected by who's inputting and who, who, has, who has access to participate even in the design. So that was my sort of first reflection. And the next one I was thinking about is something else I heard from the mouth of an artist a couple months ago around the fact that their big interest, this was a private reflection, sorry, a, a, a personal reflection they were sharing, but their interest in the design and de development and deployment of AI was around what might go underground. Mm -hmm. So when you think about this notion of, of who's in these systems and tools and who's able to access them and influence them, for all of those who are unable to participate and access in that way, there will be a whole cadre and subsystems will emerge of people who seek to disrupt the use of that technology in and of itself. So I think that's important to think about too. So I guess the, I think your question originally was around R&D and, and, and sort of the opening of that. But I guess I would throw back the question, are we looking at a brave new world in which R&D means something completely different? I mean, if the, if the cultural mechanism that we then encode, the way the sort of AI is getting deployed across our entire systems and institutions proves to be in the way that some people are painting this world, then the true R&D won't be an R&D anymore, will it? It will be out with those systems. <clears throat> That would be my challenge back. Do you like yeah, that, Chris? Yeah, no, fantastic. And of course, it bound up in the academy. We don't research. Um, my mum thinks I teach all the time. When I, the students are fantastic. In fact, there are there are raw talent in terms of potentially transgressing, exploring. So the thrilling idea that again, fine art schools, computer science schools are full of access, access probably on the outside to then go inside and tear down and explore. So. Um, I, I lament the loss of the art school, I remember it, so maybe we can recover that. But there's something we can do about that, isn't there? And I guess the, there was one other point that you just reminded me of, sorry to come back in. Not at all. 
Um, in the same way, I like to challenge people to learn more about economic policy. I think economic literacy contributes a lot to our inability to truly challenge the kind of fiscal decisions our governments make. I think the same is true here for this technology. For, so for every one of us that stands up here and is concerned about democratization or access, we should be thinking about how are we increasing the literacy of people to engage with these tools and systems. That is the most powerful way to combat the kind of discourse and public-facing media narrative that confounds and sort of may hamper our ability to co-produce in more meaningful ways with each other. Yeah. So yeah, free the knowledge, basically. No, yeah, really. Can I, and so with that in mind, in terms of, because there, there are business models running, temporary um, ad hoc business models. How many of you pay for GPT-4? Hands up, right up. One, two, three, four, five, six. OK. Hands up if you pay for Mid Journey or Dali or any, um, uh, yes, yeah, similar, same people. <laughs> so again, those are barriers, uh, blocks, uh, pay to play, pay to be advanced, pay to hack potentially, pay to be informed. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm looking at my IT manager. At, um, do we pay for them? Do we offer licenses? Uh, we do, Edinburgh University has just rolled out uh, GPT-4. Uh, interface for, for certain students. Yeah, okay. But I, th I think this, this sort of digital divide between those who uh, have the, the kind of the wherewithal, either financial or sort of, sort of technical to access these technologies, those who are coming from a different background, I think is a really big thing for us. So the, this is the heart of the question. How does it transform my spaces as well as opening up the other? So my final question, I'm hoping you're going to fill in soon after this because it's a great discussion so far, but Help me out next. Um, attribution and ultimately permission seem to be vital parts of a high functioning gen AI culture. In other words, we have a lot of work to do in the short term to make sure that the large language, image, and audio models contain material that the originators are happy for us to use. So back to this question of who's going into my house, my archives, my cloud, and using my material. Assuming we get past that, and I don't know what it looks like, I have no clue whether it's, um, I can't believe it's blockchain, but there's a way to perhaps trace attribution, possibly even have kickbacks on the use of my pixels. But can you envision new collaborative cultures for the creative industries, ones that we haven't conceived of yet, or will it all end up in the law courts? Where does it go? Do you want to have to get first, Lara? Well, <clears throat> Ooh, I'm conscious there's a lawyer in the room I met over coffee or before coffee this morning. So I will start with saying I love and respect the law. <laughs> um, let's hope that the law is not the only means of deriving and driving change in this construct. That would be my starting premise. I mean, speaking in relationship to the specific situation we've got here in the UK, I was very pleased to see just yesterday on Twitter slash X, uh, the Secretary of State for um, Culture, Media and Sport had hosted a roundtable discussion specifically on generative AI with the creative industries, and then finally made a declarative statement publicly about the, basically the need for remuneration for creators. I mean, we haven't had a peep for quite some time, so I think there is some positive noise coming in this space. Um, <clears throat> but I would go back to um, something that, again, might sound idealistic, but I, I don't know why we have to envision this world. I don't know why we can't just take control and make it right now. I don't know why we accept the premise that the current paradigm is even okay. And I don't mean in a way where we want to sit around belly aching about how rubbish it all is, but more, why haven't we just dragged our seats to the table and said, now it's time to change the nature of what's happening? Because there would be none of these tools and systems without the incredible gifts of innovators and creators and musicians and artists. And that is what in fact feeds these machines and tools and systems. So I come back to this notion that if we can get it right for creators, then we'll get it right for UK PLC. We'll get it right at large for economic reasons. We'll get it right culturally. We'll get it right socially. So I would like to just flip the whole thing on its head. And when I think about think about how we can change it now and the vision that we should should bring to the table now is let's get it right for creators first. Why, why, do, why do creators have to be the last seat at the table? Yeah. Uh, okay, so you, you, you asked us to, to sort of try and put this conversation into the future. And there's a... There's, there's, um, a technical possibility that I think I think we need to be mindful of because I, I, I think everything you say is right about the current state of affairs with uh, mass scraping deep learning techniques. What what I want to ask is how quickly might we uh, encounter new techniques? And I think the answer is possibly very very quickly. In fact, Darcy um, <laughs> is doing is doing things like this where you're building very powerful generative AI systems and they don't actually rely on people's data. And like I mean, these might be rule based systems, good old fashioned rule based systems. I believe that's where Darcy's working. Absolutely. This is this is really important to see 
uh, kind of the, you know, the tidal wave is followed by another tidal wave. Um, we've done all of this fighting for protecting people's right not to be trained on, and I think that's uh, on the face of it a very, a, a very important. And I mean, there's a there's a clear moral case, and it's pretty pretty clear cut. My question though is, we it seems like what is very likely to happen is that the world becomes literally flooded with copy, uncopyrightable creative content that can be produced by anyone. Uh, and I don't think we have good answers for how we protect creators from that. Um, and it's a different type of debate. And it, and it completely uh, is a debate that's kind of happening, not necessarily in the copyright space. So there, there, there I'd be a radical lefty. Uh, but you know, we, we, need to, we need to constantly be looking outside of sort of individualist capitalist frameworks for supporting the arts. Sets up Darcy. <laughs> okay, go. Okay. So you can solve it, Cam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that's it's a huge task. But let's let's just clear this up. If um, if I was describing AI as it applies to music to uh, one of my children, I would explain uh, in the broadest terms there are two models. For those of you who are not familiar, there is the what I describe as the top-down model. Imagine I'm feeding an AI black box, uh, the Beatles back catalog or uh, Universal Music's back catalog and expecting some wonderful track out of this AI black box. Uh, immoral, unethical, uh, it, certainly a breach of copyright, uh, illegal, not anything we want to get involved in um, uh, for, for all sorts of reasons. And then there's the bottom-up model, which is teaching AI the mathematical principles of composition, the heuristics of composition, to ensure that when an artist sits down with these tools, and they are just tools for an artist, if used ethically, that they can create. And what they create is theirs. Now, certainly from our perspective, there are large language models that say, I want a, a rap track, 130 BPM, give me. Attribution is key here. There is no level of human artistry in that. There must be a level of human artistry sufficient to secure copyright. If you don't secure copyright, there's no revenue. And the swathes of uncopyrightable music going out there into the marketplace. Uh, again, a, a dreadful prospect, uh, not something that we want to uh, enjoy. So yes, uh, on a daily basis, we fight for the rights of the artist, uh, the rights holder, the composer, to give them new opportunities, to give them revenue streams that they wouldn't have otherwise seen. Uh, imagine a world where looking at the audience here, who, who, who's done any gaming, uh, online gaming in their leisure time. Imagine a world where I can enjoy that game and it's not five guys in LA that have frankly decided the soundtrack to the game you're playing globally. Uh, imagine a world where the geographies, cultures, uh, genres, individual tastes are, are, are catered for but not just that, uh, the dynamic gameplay uh, is, uh, the music is adapted against your dynamic gameplay, against external inputs, speed, acceleration, against emotional components. Imagine a world where we're playing Call of Duty and with respect, you're kicking my ass. Oh, yeah, so uh, your, your soundtrack should be triumphant. And, and you're sat in Guadalajara, I'm in Sydney, Australia. Our soundtrack should be different. Now, done correctly, there are revenue streams for artists globally, not just five artists who get the commission for Call of Duty, but everybody. Uh, we're opening up, uh, or I, certainly our goal is to open up new revenue streams, new opportunities for artists the world over. Artists to collaborate. A kid in Guadalajara is a genius at beats. Uh, and then there's another one in Sydney, Australia, who's fabulous at orchestration. Get them together. What can they create collaboratively? These tools can allow that. And 
again, ethical tools with attribution, having secured the copyright and the level of human artistry, um, we'll, we'll see the entire market lift and, and us as an audience benefit from that. I love it. That was good. That was a good half hour. Um, right, now it's your job. Okay, I'll just spend some time thinking about those on the train down. But um, any questions now? To Here we go. Terrific. So please say your name when you grab the mic and um, we'll see if they're directed. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. The first one is for Ken, actually just picking up on one of the last things you said was about needing to have some element of human artistry. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to define that a bit. Um, but before you do, I have a more general question for the whole panel, which is, I think it's wonderful, this idea that somehow we're going to protect copyright, but there's a dark place inside me that thinks actually we're entering into a post-copyright era, and that actually remuneration is going to look very different. Um, and so rather than sort of stomping up and down and saying, how are we going to protect this thing that we've already had, that we've all, not always had, that actually has been relatively recent in the span of, of human history, the idea of copyright. How can we look forward to how to manage a society where that's not possible? Thank you. Lara's ready. So. Well, <laughs> I only have one useful thing to say, so I thought I'd get in there first before someone beats me to it. <clears throat> okay, so if I take the premise that we're entering into a post-copyright age, which is a really great challenge, I wonder if there's just one principle that we could take forward, that there has to be better balance between who generates value, who creates that value, who extracts the value, and who profits from it. If we just took that as one principle in which we sought more equitability, I think we'd be in a, in a very good place. That's it. Thank you. Ken, give him the answer. Yeah, uh, a great question. Um, yes, we do deliberately set the benchmark very high. Um, and from a user interface, uh, those tools that allow you to create me a rap track, create me 130 BPM, whatever it might be, uh, the benchmark is so low that the industry will determine whether that is copyrightable, whether the level of human artistry is, is, has been achieved. Uh, from our perspective, we do that internally. We decide as a company of composers, artists, lecturers, we decide internally how high that benchmark has to be. And, uh, and with lawyers, with uh, legislation, with rulings, we say, yes, if you use these tools, yes, the level of human artistry is sufficient to secure copyright. Now, I would also say these are digital tools and we can track every single note created, the output, every note is created, and attribution is key. Imagine a world where uh, rather than, th there's a famous sample that's been used uh, about six and a half thousand times in pop songs that you've heard throughout your entire adult life. Uh, it's a track by the Winstons, a 1963 track called- The Amen uh, Break. The Amen Break, yeah, there we go. Uh, there's an industry professional. Yes. Um, now imagine a world where rather than that being stolen, sampled, uh, uh, and no money has gone to the Winstons, imagine a world where artists, composers can contribute into a, an environment where if those samples, those notes were used by somebody else, an attribution is awarded. And, and that artist, and it's a revenue stream. Uh, it, uh, I would argue that in a digital world, we are in a position to track every single note and where that note has come from. Oli, do you want anything to add? <laughs> so much. Yeah, <laughs> let's, keep, let's try and keep to time. Um, I, I mean, yeah, it's huge. Really, really good points. Um, I mean, I, I just, I, I love the provocation and I think it's so important to think about. I mean, if you hang around in the in the kind of creative AI music circles, you hear a lot of people saying, oh, you know, that copyright era, thank God that's over. Um, you know, the information is free, blah, blah, blah. And um, yes, yeah, so it's very interesting who you hang around with. Um, but potentially um, the opposite of what you're saying could actually unfold. 
Uh, from where I'm standing, I think this is, you know, it's very much undetermined. Uh, what I mean is that uh, w w one of the most critical points that's happening right here, right now, is that um, we've never had copyright laws that cover style. Copyright laws cover specific infringements of specific works. And the big thing that generative AI models do is that they very successfully rip off style in a hyper-industrialized way. All, all people can go and rip off each other's style, and that's okay. And we, we, we sort of, the world has settled into a, into, a, into a holding pattern where we, you know, we have this boundary between right and wrong, and it's a, it's a fine line, and it's constantly being contested. But one, one of the things that generative AI models have done is they've, they've really put that in the spotlight. Why don't we have copyright that covers style? Should we have copyright that covers style? Uh, it sort of terrifies me because what I, what I would see if we were to take that step would be that we end up in a sort of you know, copyright hell nightmare where everything is being contested all of the time. And we don't want, you know, when we think about fair and reasonable copyright settings, um, we have to balance uh, people's, you know, fundamental moral rights with, with practical things and copyright has always done that. Copyright has always been incredibly fragmented and piecemeal and applies in very different ways to different types of cultural products. So to add even more complexity there, we're seeing a situation, for example, in music where the cultural product, which is standardly the, the unit, the track, um, the single song or audio recording that we've been become accustomed to over a hundred years of exchanging and trading and that being the main unit of uh, financial exchange and attribution that's being blown open by some of the things that are happening right now. Uh, so I, 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 I'm all for all of the kind of technical solutions to micropayments and attribution and tracing attribution and so on. But there's going to be a point where, I mean, there's always going to be this hotly contested frontier. And, and what we, again, just sort of repeating my earlier point, what we must not lose sight of is what we're really here to support, which is... Um, the, the value of the arts in society. That doesn't necessarily mean specific creators. It just, it, it's, it's a collective social phenomenon. Terrific. I mean, again, meanwhile, there's a, there's a beyond for creators. There's a beyond for fintech, reg tech, going on all the time, right? So these are all in parallel with a whole bunch of business models. Yeah. Hello, I don't think I've ever spoken into a microphone. Um, <laughs> I'm probably the youngest and least experienced person in this room, um, but... Hang on my, there, hang on there. <laughs> you can't judge a woman by her age. Um, but my, I suppose, it's for the whole panel, but I identify quite closely with Lara because my master's was from the Centre of Cultural and Media Policy Studies, but I suppose, before you call me ignorant, my question has a bit of background to it, but I suppose I want to ask, why do we need AI? Because as someone, I'm a student, and this might shock people, I'm a student who's never used ChatGPT. And I don't really want to. I'm never, I, my masters, everyone else in my course, I was the only British person in my course, everyone else used ChatGPT, I never wanted to do it. I just sort of have an aversion to it. And I suppose my experience of AI is quite surface level. It's through LinkedIn AI now that they have and things generated by AI that you see on Facebook. It's like, oh, what would this have looked like how many, many years ago AI generated and things like that. Um, and I'm also a creative person, I write, and I've never wanted to use AI to write things for me because I think, and I felt a quite a disadvantage when other people did because I think it takes away an aspect of originality and creativity because although it, as you said, there's a level of human artistry to it and you need that level to create things, I think it's drawing upon things which already exist as far as I know. AI can't generate things which haven't already been generated by someone else. And you can argue that originality doesn't exist anymore and nothing new can be generated, but AI can't generate something that hasn't existed, whereas a person can. And so I suppose why do we need AI to do things for us? Nice, nice, nice question. That's good. Who wants to have a go at that one? Straight from the heart. Just, I just, um, thanks for that that question, and it's um, yeah, good on you for being a student who hasn't used GPT. Um, <laughs> keep it that You're way. You're the last. <laughs> you might be the only one. Yeah. I wish you very high, high grades. Um, uh, so, I mean, you're actually touching on uh, a very old debate because that goes back to um, Ada Lovelace um, talking to Charles Babbage about the, uh, the very nature of machines. Um, uh, 
capability to originate anything, which may have taken place in this room, as far as I know. I don't know, it's somewhere around here. Um, and that's you know, that's a 19th century uh, topic, which which rages today. Um, so I, I I have a particular take on that, and it's one of the things that um, I've that, that I do kind of I have worked through over the last few years in terms of creative autonomy of machines. Um, I, I'd be careful about assuming that uh, even even very blunt um, uh, machine learning models that perform uh, supervised learning uh, can't originate things um, because uh, essentially there is, I mean, th this is what's being investigated quite closely at the moment in terms of GPT and its capabilities, is that it does have emergent properties. It's a system of such complexity and such scale that emergent things start to happen. Um, I think Noam Chomsky just recently wrote this sort of brutal article calling it um, a, a plagiarism machine, and that's that's certainly a take that I'm completely sympathetic with. I mean, it, 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 um, it ingests lots of people's content and then it produces content that's very much like that. But I just, I just, and yeah, this is a very kind of weaselly minor point, but I just, want, I just want to draw attention to the fact that there is potential for creative emergence to happen in a complex system like that. And I, I, again, just, just to bring it to the future, um, right now what people are doing is uh, particularly OpenAI and the companies that are driving these things is they're plugging these incredibly complex, sophisticated systems which can perform basic reasoning and basic um, concept manipulation. And they're plugging them into the internet and making them feed back on themselves. And if you've ever sat there and watched, um, there's, there's a tool called GPT Interpreter, which is, uh, it actually writes code, but then in addition it runs that code. And you sit there and you watch it. You, uh, I did this the other day, I said, I said here's a waveform, Here's an audio file. Please write me the code to extract the fundamental frequency from this audio file. It says, here we go, let me look on the internet. Oh, we can do this. It writes this Python script and it runs it in, in front of your eyes. And, and um, uh, actually what's quite funny is like sometimes there's an error and there's a, there's a bug in the code and it says, oh, hang on, I've forgotten to import this library. Let me just correct this uh, floating point. Um, arithmetic and here we go now it works and and so what you're seeing there is a system that isn't just regurgitate isn't just a feed forward process it's actually an iterative process and it's terrifying um, <laughs> and uh, you know you really you know, that's, that's probably my biggest moment so far today of, of looking at a system do something and just going stop this um, and I think in the generative space it's a very short leap to the point where we have text to audio generators being directly fed into a music streaming platform, I won't suggest any names, um, that that then you know gets gets some audience response and you know human feedback that then adjusts what it generates. And at that moment, you cannot say that these dumb machine learning systems are just merely plagiarism generators. They can originate stuff. Yeah, sorry, Lauren. Okay. Oh. Okay. I'll be really quick. I'll say yes, absolutely. It's called learning. Mm. Uh, we, we walk into schools as a blank canvas and we are taught, uh, you know, musically, musical theory. Uh, you teach these AIs musical theory. Uh, absolutely, they can generate and, and do generate. Uh, and it, it's, it is just learning. Lara? I just had a closing thought for you, really, about your, it was more about your decision not to use those systems and tools and to say that in and of itself is a response to this emergent technology, and that's interesting in and of itself. So I think if that's the choice that you continue to make in your personal and professional practice and to do so conscientiously and to understand your reasons for doing so is in and of itself its own disruptive innovation. Yeah, I think mean, fascinating. I've got a, probably in another world, another intersectional um, part of a city. Someone, I, mean, I don't know that you are a washroom middle classes. We probably wrote to our primary school teachers and said, I am uncomfortable with my son or daughter. Many other people in the, in the city, in the community, haven't got the confidence to write. Mm -hmm. So I suppose in another independent space, someone is using, I'm going to ask ChatGPT to write a letter to a head teacher to defend the rights of my child. And that person also has a chance to do something disruptive. So I think disruption is relative, but terrific question, great to situate. Okay, I'm gonna go. We'll do the three, one, two, three guys. We've done two gals, but we'll do three guys. So we'll one, two, three. 
Hi, thank you. My name's John. Um, I had a question about copyright, and it started off with the politician's um, analogy, which I think is really reductive, because I, I really question whether a law court or a whole swathe of people are going to agree with the panel that it is copyright infringement. Because is a human artist who is inspired by photographs they might have seen or paintings they've been to see in a gallery then creates an artwork, that's not copyright infringement. It can be when you start to incorporate specific bits, uh, but that's another level. But in general, what's happening with AI, it's behaving like a human brain. That's the whole point. It's a neural network. It's not a database of JPEGs that have been scraped. That was how it was trained in the way that we're trained by observing as we go around. So I think it's much more complex than that, unfortunately, because I do agree attribution is, is key. Uh, and on attribution, as a follow-up question, is it actually possible to go back through a neural network to attribute a specific artist or creator because the AI engineers can't even explain how it spits out what it spits out because it's operating like a brain that's already ingested this information. Good question. Getting into it now, me. <laughs> um, go, Ken. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll attempt uh, to answer that question. Uh, I'll try anyway. Um, uh, the, f the first answer is, uh, can an, an AI analyze a piece of music and determine uh, the, the component parts of that piece of music? Yes. Uh, music information retrieval is a uh, long uh, study discipline. Uh, what AI has allowed uh, certain fields to be able to do is to analyze music at, at vast, on vast scales and effectively create what you might imagine is a copyright tool. It is to say, this track is, I, I'm a, imagine I'm a label, I'm sat in an office, in a swanky office in London somewhere, and a new artist comes in with this fabulous track, plays it to me, <coughs> I love it, but I throw it into an AI and wow, that is absolutely so close to a track that was uh, originally published in 1961. Uh, okay, uh, what you must also be able to do in terms of copyright is one of the principles of copyright infringement is I must prove exposure to that track. I must sit down with the artist, have you heard that track? Um, and if you can prove that you, yes, you've been exposed, intent, blah, 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 you're in breach of copyright. There are accidental uh, infringes, infringements of, of copyright, certainly. But yes, an AI, all of these tools, can analyze music and determine to the best of their ability that this is very close to that track. Now, it is then up to the law courts to prove those principles of copyright infringement, starting with exposure. Now we can move through questions faster. Or? Uh, I just wanted to add, just just to clarify for the audience, I, I didn't say I agreed with the politician's metaphor. <laughs> I, I thought it was a very useful metaphor for pointing out the extent of the power imbalance, most of all. So not even about the copyright issue in particular. Do we move on to another one? Oh, awesome. you want to go? Yeah. I, I'll, just, I'll just say one quick word, which is I think it's, it's, you, you touch on a really important point because a lot of a lot of technologist minded people are sort of saying, Well, I don't get it, what's the difference? This is this is what humans do. We we listen and we're inspired and we reproduce. So what's wrong with the machine doing it? The point is it's a political it's a political question. And and ontologically it's like it doesn't matter if you build a machine that really resembles a human creative <coughs> process. It's it's owned by a corporation and it's um, embedded in, in a socio-technical web that's completely different from the way that we exist in the world, and that's really essential. Right. right. Uh, Hi, I'm Josh. I, I work for the London Borough of Lambeth, specifically as a creative economy manager, so uh, intrigued by the intersection of policy here. But this is my second conference plenary in two weeks around creative industries and AI. Um, and Lara, your really beautiful articulated point, the real losers are those not in this room, not in the room discussing it, or don't even have the opportunity to choose not to use ChatGPT. Um, this is a massive question, I'd expect the, the resolution in this moment, but how do we bring people, especially in my case, I work business, but also residents, how do we bring people into the room? We talked a lot about the academy today, 
um, presumably not the award, the award, uh, collecting an Oscar, but like how do we bring people into the academy? How do we bring people into not buying into the fear mongering of AI stealing a job? I think that's a real important consideration right now. What, me, really? <laughs> oh, I, I, I appreciate the perspectives of everyone on the panel. I think it's a, a really rich conversation so far. Lots of these panels are very dull, I think, so I hope we're bucking the trend. Um, I guess my first response to your question would be uh, to throw it back to everybody in the room to think about their own responsible approaches when they're engaging with this material, with these decisions, with these debates, with these discussions. I hate to sound a bit trite, but it is as simple as sometimes stopping and saying, who have we invited into this conversation? Who have we facilitated to be here today? Who have we actively supported and in reach to? How accessible is the conversation that we're having? I mean, uh, to your academy point, I did have to ask Chris before the panel what he meant by the academy, so you're not alone. <laughs> um, but I also think things like m the myth busting bit that I think you're also referring to starts with creating space in which people can have honest, frank conversations. So that has to start with language that's accessible for more than the vantage point that even you, you know, as a leader in Lambeth, will be using. And to think about how you create space in which it's all right to ask questions that may or may not make sense. And it's all right to say, I don't understand what you're talking about. And I think um, we would all benefit from taking those kinds of approaches into most of our conversations. So it might sound very simple, but I actually think those two interventions in and of themselves would be quite radical if you were bringing them into your, your daily work, probably. Uh, you mentioned redundancies, uh, uh, redundancies in terms of human beings. Um, I'll say my wife lectures in education uh, at a uh, university in the UK, remain nameless, um, and I know from research undertaken that my youngest son, who's uh, eight years old, I know it's staggering, eight, uh, that fifty percent of all jobs that his generation will spend their entire life doing haven't even been invented yet. Uh, redundancies, uh, if we talk about the Model T Ford and, and cars, uh, where did all the farriers go? Where did all the, the horse breeders go? They retrained, they evolved, we do, we adapt. Uh, and that's what we'll do in, in this world. But I would uh, perhaps finish with tools that empower, tools that uh, afford a disadvantaged, uh, and that not just disadvantaged economically, but disadvantaged physically, whatever it might be, tools that allow, that empower those people to have their, to get their voice heard is, is an incredible experience and very humbling for us. Uh, we work with many universities uh, and, uh, and schools, one of which is the Brit School. Uh, and we came across uh, a little while ago, and I'll leave you with this, a young singer-songwriter. Uh, and one of our staff members identified this singer-songwriter. Thinks, and we, we thought, clearly a genius, but a genius in her own head. She can hear the top line of a track in her head. But this particular artist, or sorry, songwriter, is dyslexic, dyspraxic. She's autistic to the level that she finds it very difficult to use a smartphone. How does her voice get out? We sit her down with a series of tools and, and help, and we give her that voice. And to hear that track come out of the speakers uh, in front of her at Abbey Road Studios, uh, and to see her reaction and, and see her tears in the car park outside, everything you do is worthwhile from that point on. You, you generate these tools so you can empower, disseminate uh, a new breed, a new generation of creators, and they will use different tools. There's no turning back the clock. They will use these tools. Artists, we all read the surveys, artists are very keen to explore these tools and to use them as they did with drum machines and synthesizers. Uh, this, this is the future. We do have to be very careful, ethically, uh, and ask yourself the question every day, if you're using these tools, are they ethical tools? 
uh, and I, I just leave you with, with that. Uh, please. Do you want to extend Oli, or should you uh, just, just a yeah, tiny sort of reinforcement. I mean, I, I, it's a great question because it's a reminder of the ways that we, the new new AI tools will uh, have great benefits as well as potential risks. Um, supporting grassroots youth cultures, um, and, and coming back to the discussion of amen breaks and samples, that was you know sort of where I cut my teeth in music creation, um, which it broke it broke rules actually and it infringed copyright, but it created incredible cultures, pirate radio and so on. Um, so just taking a free-form approach, seeing what's actually happening, what kids are interested in. Um, and I mean, yeah, to, to talk up those, the kinds of tools that um, you're building, um, enhancing music education is a massive one because access to music education is such an uneven space. And sorry, I do talk entirely in music. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone can apply this to art, different art forms, but um, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's a really interesting area for AI. For example, I'm a, I'm a musician who was never trained and doesn't have very good music theory, and I really see the value of those tools to actually help me understand why a certain chord does a certain thing. Not just to generate it for me, but to help me in, be engaged in a music creation task. And and we mustn't forget that, that, that those tools can be um, stimulating aesthetically, intellectually, in and of themselves as activities in themselves, as well as just a means to an end of producing outputs. Good question here, and then I'll look for the last one or two questions. Um, hello, my name is Piotr. Um, for disclosure, I'm a speaker tomorrow at another panel. Um, I have a question regarding um, this um, idea of extreme personalization. So one of the um, suggestions, I think, um, about what was given at the end uh, of the the main discussion um, was that maybe users and uh, cultural consumers would really enjoy having very highly personalized uh, cultural artifacts. So let's say hear music that corresponds exactly to the uh, to, to what happens in the game with all specific characters. But isn't this exactly what generative AI is much more capable of doing, as opposed to? Um, the uh, traditional forms of AI or traditional generative models, which are much more heavily curated and dependent on the uh, on the engineer's choices, and isn't and can't you just or can't you also say that the uh, generative AI, it, uh, the open source tools allow people to retrain those models and to remix constantly, and so effectively with all the um, issues of copyright that come with, all, with, with them, they are also empowering users with the capacity of remixing everything they want and to, mm, uh, to explore it creatively. Uh, I, I'd, I'd say yes. Uh, Hyper-personalization is, uh, is something that you can explore, you can ha have, or, or choose not to have. Um, as far as mixing is concerned, well, ever since somebody put a sound ca uh, card in a computer, you've been able to do that. Um, and it's at the heart of everything creative that we've listened to over the last 30, 40 years on the, the radio. Uh, artists have, have listened to what has come before and created, remixed it. Uh, legally or n not legally, um, so it, it's it's the status quo. Uh, it's it's happening right now, and it's been happening for the last 40, 50 years. I, I only had a cheeky reflection, which is completely irrelevant, but sorry, it just crossed my mind, so I'm going to say it. I was just wondering if we could we could reverse engineer that capability so that you don't have to listen to certain types of things in public spaces. <laughs> great, great point. Um, <laughs> and uh, just, I mean, just to echo the great point about open source, which hasn't been mentioned yet, um, it's, uh, in, in my experience of 15 years working in creative technologies in an academic context, um, there's so much cultural vibrancy in open source software communities and uh, uh, I don't know, maybe those, maybe those things are being eroded and that we actually just need to get behind open source initiatives. I mean, there's lots of talk about data sovereignty, you know, and AI model sort of, you know, sovereignty and those kinds of things. 
Uh, so yes, I mean, a, a, a great simplistic response is let's let's support a pluralism of approaches. Um, and I forgot the other point. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, a question here from the audience. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Achal. I work with the British Council. Uh, I work with the India Arts team. And my question is around this pluralism and kind of being more inclusive. And while we're in London, and this is kind of a UK-centric thing, I want to know, I want to tell you why this is important for us, is that uh, the world over, mostly Global South, does look at UK and US as being sort of the forerunners in figuring out what governments should do, what industry should do. A lot of what we consume comes from predominantly still the UK and the US. And so everything that you say here has great implications actually much beyond your borders. And so if we are looking at a more inclusive table, um, it is also important to reflect on all those other voices that are being left out, um, especially in context of people who are not on the internet but are creators, is it time to therefore, in this large library that AI would be using, would it be possible for now for them to be included, who has been included, uh, excluded till now? We go back to Lara's point at the start, I mean, sorry, you did set yourself up, but it's good, it's inclusion. Well, it, doesn't, it shouldn't be very radical to have to argue for inclusivity, should it? But, um, uh, but I do feel like every time I'm able to have a public platform, I do start from that position because I'm, I'm just very conscious of that. Um, so with respect, I can't answer your question technically because I'm not that intellectually capable, but hopefully my two panelists next to me can. But what I would say is the presence of the global majority in particular in relationship to cross-country collaboration is mission critical to creating something more equitable, particularly when it comes to the design use and adoption of technology. So I think that I take your point um, with a bit of pain about the position and status of both the US and the UK as a dual citizen. Uh, so I'll, I'll take that both my, my lumps of coal, um, but also uh, respect that position by virtue of its its power to be able to celebrate and amplify what should should exist and what should be good and right in the world. Um, and I do, I do take your point in particular about the cultural and creative industries policy aspect in the UK being a vanguard for lots of places in the world. So please take it on behalf of at least my organization, Creative UK, that we will absolutely keep banging that drum. But I do think um, in relationship to the broader sort of technological development question, n nowhere has it ever been more important. That's too many negatives for the global majority to have a seat at this table. And cross-country collaboration is 100% required to deal with um, the rapid advancement of this technology. I hope you guys can answer her technical question, because it's a great one, yeah, actually. Where is there space for makers and creators who don't participate in digital environments for whatever reasons? Not sure I can answer that particular, <laughs> particular question, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 such, uh, it's such an important point. I mean, I was, I was just, um, I, I'm currently interviewing and researching music AI startups uh, and I've started to look at uh, Indian startups and uh, interviewed a great one the other day called Beat, Beat Haven that's a generative AI tool that um, is doing incredible work and I'm just very excited to see, um, you know, and I'm very hopeful to see uh, just a continued uh, increase of global participation from every corner of the globe and as a, as a, a musical omnivore I can't think of anything more important. Um, and, and this is really important because we have so many debates which get which are framed by national priorities. And so when I write funding applications in Australia, I have to say how it benefits Australia. And at that point, I just want to go, you know, <laughs> how do I, okay, <laughs> what, why? <laughs> um, but obviously I do because that's the global politics of it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I mean, as to as to how um, we do that, yeah, I mean, I think we just we we actually need to we, we need to push the argument when we're speaking in national and local contexts that um, supporting creative I mean, the things I've talked about supporting creativity uh, as as an end in itself as a social sort of objective uh, has a local component. Um, the, you know, in Lambeth Council, there's important local things that need to be done, but uh, it has such, a, <laughs> such an obvious global component. We shouldn't, 
we, and we should really keep that front and center. You know, if, if it has to be captured in the language of diplomacy or whatever, um, we're you know we're we're all better off for uh, greater inclusion and engagement. Any last thoughts on that? Yeah, the the tools allow us whether those tools, the internet, Spotify, Apple Music, uh, your phone. Uh, uh, whether they are instruments, whether they are a, a piano, a guitar, it's music technology. Let's please remember that. The just evolution of music technologies. Most, most music created now, you know where it's created? In a bedroom. Uh, that is the, the heart of creativity. A young person, wherever they are in the world, and if they have access to a a drum, a guitar, a, a didgeridoo, or an iPhone, doesn't matter. Uh, we're just really pushing the boundaries of who is able to access these tools. Uh, and I'll go right back to the, the point I made first. How many Beethovens have we missed? Not Beethoven, but how many Beethovens have we missed who never got access to the tools to allow them to explore their creativity? I'm going to trigger myself for the last one. So I think the panel have done very well. What they've laid up is a whole bunch of um, bottom lines, um, the creative bottom line, uh, the role for imagination and to be co-creative with cultures. They're also an economic one in terms of kickbacks, attribution. Somehow or other, someone will figure that out. Unfortunately, Larry, you mentioned the coal. What about the environmental bottom line? What do we do when we speak of the shift when actually these tools are north um, global north and actually climate crisis and climate catastrophe is going to affect people now and in, in different spaces which have not got the same benefits to weigh up the losses so that makes sense. they're probably seeing the losses against our benefits um, what do we do with a bottom line that speaks to the moral environmental responsibility sorry <laughs> I know let's go you said let's make it spiky <laughs> okay um, it's a really great point, and uh, I can say Creative UK is currently um, just beginning the process of doing really deep dive interviews um, in different subsectors across the UK in relationship to um, their positions on AI design, development, and application. And the climate action, climate change piece is probably the one in which every conversation I've had so far, everyone's going, "Yeah, we're trying to." They're starting to pull through their existing positions on what they think about the world in relationship to climate change and bring that round to the AI corner, I'd throw that back and say, what is the line from big tech on this? Because actually with great power comes great responsibility. So if we require cloud computing on a scale that we simply find is not feasible given the state of our burning planet, um, I, I would say we have to ask those who are developing to come with the solutions at the same time as wishing support for further expansion. I'm tr not trying to squeeze my way out of the question, but I can't no, be an it's, it's a tough one. Well, and I can't be an expert in everything, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to have a go at this? It's a spiky mic, it's a hot mic. Yeah, 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 yeah it's, it's, warm. it's definitely getting warmer. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, I think I have a, a, a the, uh, in terms of energy, emissions, um, the climate crisis, uh, I mean, the, the, the obvious thing is, is, is the stuff that happens at a global, international, collaborative level that is blanket. Um, management of the problem and specific industries need to do their specific things but I mean, I'm really just a strong believer that um, everything comes down to global um, leadership and collaboration um, but yes uh, individual companies can just take a moral stance because the people that work in those companies are humans and take a moral stance and you know there's um, so I, I guess yes we can resist certain directions I mean Bitcoin was and NFTs were uh, we seem to have forgotten completely that they existed, but you know, they, were, they were a hot thing a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, there was a lot of debate about that, and and um, it's quite nuanced. I mean, I mean, some some speaker somewhere in uh, some context said, you know, if you just if you just price, if, if you actually just price the, the cost of use of it, we all use electricity all the time. Mm. Um, we make personal choices about where we use electricity and, and, and how and what, what's right and wrong. Um, at the end of the day, you, you have to have a global top-down sort of control. Yeah. Last word, Ken. Yeah, it's, it should be on everybody's agenda. Uh, there's, uh, there's an environmental consideration for everything we do. Uh, if we just think about music, yes, 
from the first person who chopped down a tree to say, I'm going to build a, a, a piano, uh, to uh, everybody's running around still buying vinyl. Well, vinyl, it's an oil-based product. Uh, so yeah, there are considerations for every stage of our evolution. Um, so keep it at the very top of our agenda. Great, look, that's been a good hour. Thank you, so, thank you to panelists. Did a good job, didn't they? Good, um, great questions as well. Really nice moments coming from different perspectives, um, understanding how we engage with it. So thank you very much. I think there's probably more coffee downstairs, but um, thanks, folks. Thank you.